Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo. Today we're looking at Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Now before we get started, it's important that we make sure there, that we're walking with the Lord in fellowship. So let's make sure we confess our known sins at the same time that we're controlled with the Spirit. So let's give ourselves over to Him also. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and everything you have provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open, ready to hear it, learn it, believe it, and then apply it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a simple, rather short, instructive psalm. This psalm has both lines of wisdom and praise. It speaks of evil people and the types of things they do and then ends with the psalmist in trust and praise to God. Let's look at the outline for a moment. It only has nine verses plus the superscript. A portrayal of Doeg and his destruction. We'll explain who that is in a moment. That's verses 1 through 5. Be in contrast to the righteous. So he's put in contrast his evil life in contrast to the righteous in verses 6 and 7. And then at the end, see the psalmist's own blessed life of faith, verses 8 through 9. The message put it on the board the psalmist David who trusts in the Lord's loving kindness contrast the blessings of his faith with that of an evil and treacherous man who trusts in his iniquity one of the ways I like to portray the word contrast is use the abbreviation for verses, you know, like when two teams are opposed. So a contrast is kind of like the other side. All right, so we have here the faithful versus the evil. We begin by looking at the superscript, that is the words of under the number of the psalm. Here it is. For the director of music, a skill by David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Now one of the reasons we study this superscript because it is in the original scripture too. So it's inspired. It's something we're supposed to study. The psalm begins as many do for the director of music. This is what we may also call the choir master. Next, a maskil of David. Maskil seems to be, uh, seems to connect to a word meaning wisdom. So it's some kind of wisdom. The psalm is with wisdom. Next is the event in David's life that this psalm originally referred to. David has been fleeing Saul, King Saul. On the run, he stopped in Nob. He was out of supplies. He didn't have a weapon, and he was out of food. Nob is a town in Judah that is in the direction of Philistia. Now, the Philistines were the enemies of Israel. So David is headed that direction. Uh, he stops in Nob there, still in Judah. Ahimelech is there. He's the priest. He's the local priest. He gave, bre he gave bread to David, and he happened to have Goliath's old sword. Now, Goliath, remember, he's the one that David had killed. Well, they kept his sword and put it with the priest. So he brings out the sword and gives it to David plus some food. 
Now remember, David is being pursued by Saul. But also there in the area was a man by the name of Doeg. It um, interesting name. I look at it, I almost want to see the word dog. D E, excuse me, D O E G. Just add the E in there. He was an Edomite. So he wasn't a Jew, but he was serving Saul anyway, which is kind of an unusual situation. Edom was another country that was down south um, east of Israel. Doeg, he was Saul's chief shepherd, but he happened to be there that day when David was supplied by Ahimelech. From there, David went to Achish. Now, so David crosses the border. Let's just put a little simple map up here. David left Nob, crossed the border. This is into Philistia. This is where the Philistines were. There was a town there called Gath. Now, it's interesting because Gath is the same town that was a hometown of Goliath. But it's in Philistine territory. So David is getting out of Judah and go over here, but he's taking a chance by even going to that town. Well, some of the servants of Achish, the king in Philistia, recognized David. David became afraid and pretended to be crazy, insane. Well, Achish didn't want a crazy man around, but David left and eventually ends up back in Judah in what we call the forest of Hereth. And this is in the wilderness. So this is a place that you might find difficult to live in and, and hard to find somebody. So he ends up in Judah. Then the story switches to Saul. So you leave David over in Judah in the forest of Hereth, and the story switches back to Saul, where Saul is there as king, and Elimelech, uh, remember he was the priest. Well, Doeg comes in, and he tells Saul how Ahimelech, the priest, had helped David. He resupplied him. So let's pick up the story in 1 Samuel 22. If you want to read that other part I just talked about, it's in 1 Samuel 21. Now, there's a lot of reading here, so just follow along the best you can. 1 Samuel 22, 11. Now, the king, then the king sent for the priest Ahimelech. Remember, Doeg had just reported to Saul about what Ahimelech had done. So then the king sent for the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahatub, and all the men of his family, who were the priests at Nob, and they all came to the king. Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. Yes, my lord, he answered. Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse? Of course, that's David giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of God for him, so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me, as he does today. Ahimelech answered the king, Who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard, and highly respected in your household? Was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. So Ahimelech, his answer to Saul is, I didn't know that you were after him. As far as I knew, he was loyal servant. He's well known for being loyal to you. Listen to this verse 16. The king said, you will surely die, Ahimelech, you and your whole family. Then the king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill the priest of the Lord, because they too have sided with David. They knew he was fleeing, yet they did not tell me. Now, this is not true. All right, They didn't know anything about David, what he was doing. 
Well, anyway, the story goes on, but the king's officials were unwilling to raise a hand to strike the priest of the Lord. This is something you just didn't do. These are men who were dedicated and served God. The king then ordered Doag, you turn and strike down the priest. So listen to this. So Doag the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who were who wore the linen ephod. That means they're priest. He also put a sword to Nob. That's the town, the town of the priest, with its men and women, its children and infants, little babies, and its cattle, donkeys, and sheep, even the animals. But one son of Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled to join David. So Ahimelech there in Nob escaped, and he reported to David what happened. That's in verse 21. He told David that Saul had killed the priest of the Lord. So we see how evil Doeg was. He not only killed all those men, those priests, but went into that town and slaughtered the men, women, children, infants, and animals. Now this is the thing that happened when David recall that David recalls when he writes this psalm. All right? So when we go back and look at the superscript, we understand, talking about Doeg the Edomite, when he came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Elimelech. And then we just saw that interview, you might say, that interrogation by Saul with Ahimelech. Well, David begins this psalm with a question when he says, Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all the day. Now let me just say this first. If you're looking at NIV, you'll probably see the second line translated differently. That's because the word loving kindness has a homonym. You remember what a homonym is? It's a word that looks the same that means something else. So, some of the translators, I should say the translators of the NIV, decide to take the homonym, and they get an entirely different sentence here. I don't think that's right. I think it should be kept with the word loving kindness. So, this explains, I'm just trying to explain some why the translations differ. And this fits. Now, why they do that? It could be because, well, you notice the first line talks about evil. And then you go into verse 2, it talks about evil again. So they may have thought that, no, we can't talk about God's loving kindness here. He must be talking about evil stuff again. All right? So anyway, when you look at it, though, it looks like it should be loving kindness. And that's the way I kept it. Other, other translations will have it as loving kindness, too. The loving kindness of God endures all day or or uh, last all day, something to that effect. Remember, we're translating from an ancient language. So when it says the loving kindness of God endures all day, it's telling us something differently from that other translation you might have, the NIV. So let's break this down and look at it from the beginning. David asked the evil man, why does he boast? And then in verse 2 begins to tell what he does. Right, this is verse 2, not the second line, verse 2. So typical of evil people is that they boast of what they've accomplished, the power they have. They think they're so powerful. Then David mocks him and says, Oh, mighty man. That's being sarcastic. Whatever power this evil man thinks he has, he has it because he's always dealing in treachery. It's not true power. He manipulates and lies people. You know, sometimes when someone wants to manip manipulate, in other words, make them do something that's not true, good, they'll lie to them. And there's a sense of power there of control because the guy believes him. The verse goes on to say the loving kindness of God endures. Now that's inserted, but basically the phrase is, is there all day. This is that word kessed again. 
that word we see so often in the Old Testament. The love of God is part of God's very character. It's part of his essence. And he is the all-powerful one. He's the real powerful one, not this evil person that David's mocking as the mighty man. God is mighty. That is who he is. He's an almighty God. So here's what he's saying. Why do you boast of evil, you so-called mighty man, when God is so full of love and kindness? He is really the mighty one. David writes how men like Doag use their evil tongue. We see this in verse 2. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, a tongue of deceit. The idea of plots means it devises, it calculates. Plot's a good word. Destruction. How's he going to tear somebody up? Well, he uses his tongue. It's like a sharp razor. Razor. It cuts easily and quickly. Now, the tongue, of course, is a word that represents words. So it uses devious thoughts, devious plans. It works its way to ruin people, to destroy reputations, to damage relationships. At the end of, end of he says, a tongue of deceit or deceitful tongue. The point is that the tongue is used to deceive. It lies, it manipulates, it misleads, and paints an entirely different picture than the truth. One of the common things we see today is that when someone holds a particular view or wants others to think their way, they twist the truth or leave out key parts of the story that distorts what really happened. So they don't get the whole picture, you see. This is common today. In fact, it's often used, you'll see it uh, in the news. You get a commentator on there or some newsman, they want you to see their side of the story, not the whole truth. They'll manipulate you. That's why you got to be very careful when you watch the news today. It used not to be so bad, but today it's pretty bad because it's gotten so political. Verse 3 tells us more about the evil man. Listen to this. You love evil more than good. And lying more than speaking what is right. Selah. Do you see that? He loves evil more than good. Now this is the thing we need to understand about evil people. They love being evil. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand because we think people ought to be good. But evil people like the way they are. They would rather do evil than good. They do the lie, then tell the truth. But this is what they do. Why? Because they love to be evil. Now listen, these type of people are really dangerous to have around. My goodness, if you have them as a leader in a political office, they can ruin your nation. They can take away your freedom. You see, they like to damage people. They like to do evil. Remember, evil is hurting people. They enjoy doing that. It doesn't tell us here how they do it other than using the tongue. But there are many ways people can do evil. They can lie. They can cheat. They can deceive. They can steal. They can plot devious schemes to make a person uh, get hurt somehow. Maybe take the money out of their account or or rob them from, from online, you know, how they do that today, identity theft, all that stuff. That's evil. That's out to hurt people. Then you add a little arrogance to that, arrogance that thinks they know everything, they know it all, and they're easily uh, motivated to do evil that's very destructive to people. Now listen, when they get in leadership, like the world has had evil leaders, even have some today. They can destroy people, even a nation, or start a war. 
The other interesting thing here, let's don't miss this, the second line, and lying more than speaking what is right. They do the lie than tell the truth. They love also, listen to this, living a lie. They think there's somebody they're not. And so it gives them a sense of power and control when they can manipulate people and stay in stay in a position because they've cheated to get there and they cheat to stay there. Now remember this especially in our day. Evil people love living the lie. They would rather lie and do evil than tell the truth and do good. This is the way they operate. Now listen, we need to understand that. You know, Christians are often so gullible because of what they hear the world say, or immature Christians. They'll say things like, you know that little line, there's little good in everyone. Not if they live the lie. Do you understand that? When people live a lie, their whole life is a lie. They speak lies. Their life is surrendered around protecting the lie. So they lie to cover lies. And these are the types of people you must never trust. Do not believe them. Don't trust them. Whatever you don't, don't give them your money. Whatever good they do, it's an appearance to cover something evil or for their own selfish interest. Evil people are hurtful and sometimes dangerous. We want to identify them and warn others. Now, what do we just see Doeg do? Doeg not only slaughtered the priest of the Lord, but the entire town with women, children, and infants. Now, how evil is that? They didn't do anything wrong. Neither did the priest. That didn't stop him. You know why he probably did this? He probably wanted to get good in with Saul. He probably wanted to please Saul. Maybe he'd be promoted up from being, uh, you know, where, where he was before, being a chief shepherd. We see this in history, even in modern history. Um, I know my lifetime, when evil people become dictators and slaughter the innocents. That's going on right now. You have that going on around the world, especially in communist countries. Now listen, evil people are not someone to trifle with. I mean by that, take them seriously. One of the things we should be seeing here is that evil will stop at nothing to do its evil. Now the only way to stop evil is with someone good or something good or God intervenes. Okay, you remember that. How do you stop a criminal? A police officer, or maybe yourself, if you get older and you can handle a, a weapon or something, some way to stop them. You don't want anybody to get hurt in your family or murdered or robbed or even something else. You want to stop them. Evil people need to be stopped. Don't play around with them. The last phrase, I shouldn't say phrase, the last word we have is this one you'll see it in, when I translate it, I put it in italics. It's Selah. Now that was actually added later. Dave didn't write that in. But this is a pause that's added by perhaps a choir director or somebody. We're going to pause here, which, which means uh, perhaps an interlude of music, just music, or maybe we... we um, change readers or something like that, but it's probably just an interlude of music. You know how you'll sing a song or someone will sing a song and then they'll quit singing, they'll play a line of music, then they'll come back to singing. Maybe it's something like that. We don't know for sure, but it had to do with the worship for sure. The next verse gives us a description of the tongue and how it operates. Something we've seen in part already. You love all the words that destroy you deceitful tongue. He talks to the tongue like it's a person. Destroy. Interesting word. Bala. B-A-L-A. -A. It means swallow. So translators take it as figurative for devour. 
which means destroy. You know, a lion devours its prey, it destroys it. People use their tongues to devour people, to do serious damage, to destroy them. Then he says, you deceitful tongue, you dishonest tongue. So we again see how evil people use the tongue like a destructive weapon. So be real careful when you're around evil people. Don't trust what they say. Think in terms of, I wonder who they're trying to hurt this time. In verse 5, we have the punishment, God's punishment of the evil man. Listen to this. Yet God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living, Selah. The word break here means to pull down like a house or a structure. You ever seen someone use one of those big old cranes and a wrecking ball where they crash it down with this ball that swings or they might use a bulldozer that's the idea here but it's used figuratively for breaking up a nation in jeremiah 1 10 or a person job 19 10 and here in our verse so here it means to break him down strip him of his power and this breaking down is forever. This means he's not coming back. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. That's God will snatch and tear you from your tent. It's very home, his residence. He'll uproot you from uproot you from the land of the living. Think of uproot, you think of someone go out going out and turn up a plant. Maybe getting up a tree stump out of the ground. This portrays complete destruction of everything he did, everything he was. And then to be uprooted pictures him being ripped up from life and death itself. This is a certain end will come to this person. God will bring that punishment on him. It all ends him and everything with him. Anything he had something to do with that he thought he would keep in place. So an evil dictator loses his nation, his place, his life, his family, everything he had built up. Now, think of this for a moment. Remember in verse 1, talking about the loving kindness of God? He goes on all day. But this man is quickly taken away and everything associated with him. Sometimes in history, God allows evil people to do things for long periods of time, or even an evil nation. And sometimes God uses them for his purposes. Maybe it's to punish some people that need to be awakened to God. But often evil people never turn to God. In our next section, we begin the contrast with righteousness. That's in verses 6 and 7. Contrast with righteousness. What do righteous people do <clears throat> when they come around evil people? Verse 6 gives us their response. When the righteous see this, They'll be filled with awe and will mock the evildoer, saying, now we'll get to what they say in a moment, but let's look at this first line. When the righteous see this, when they see all that evil and what they get away with, they will be filled with awe. Now, what do we mean here? Well, the word awe really means, in the Hebrew, it means fear, but also has a meaning that's different. It means you're in such amazement. You're in such astonishment. It's just so out of the ordinary. And that's the idea here. You're amazed at what all they did, all the evil they do, what they get away with, how bad they can be, how evil they are. Now think of this. If someone today did what Doeg the Edomite did, goes in there, perhaps leads a group of men, and slaughters an entire town. And people hear about it, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And that's the sense we have here. It's truly astonishing to see what some evil people will do, how far they will go in their lies, 
how much they think they can get away with. So when the righteous person sees this evildoer do what he does, he mocks him. Oh, you think you're going to get away with that, huh? Notice it says, well, mock, that's the idea of laugh at. He'll mock the evildoer, saying, that comes up in the next verse. Let's see what they say. See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his destruction. So this is what happens. You see them get away with what they do, and it's amazing. But then you see what God does. And you mock him. See the man who would not make God his refuge that is, his place of safety and strength and what life can bring. Now, we know that God protects us. He protects his own. But this is like a righteous man pointing an evil man and see. See what he stood for? He came down hard. Everything falls apart around him, and then he dies. Then he's taken out of life quickly, miserably. In contrast... No, I should say this. Then he says, but trusted in the abundance of his riches. That's what he trusted in, not God, but his own riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. In other words, what he trusted in, that castle he built, the riches he had, the wealth he sought and robbed and manipulated to get, the evil he did to get where he was, it falls down on top of him. It becomes his own destruction. What he thought was his safe place ended up being a place of destruction. It's like he saw a big storm coming and he ran inside the cave from the deadly storm only to meet a hungry bear. Now David comes back to the psalmist's own blessed life of faith. That's our last two verses, the psalmist's own blessed life of faith. Verse 8 reads, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. Well, this is the righteous person, the godly person. He says, I'm like a... A green olive tree. Now, a green olive tree would be one that's flourishing, that's healthy, that's strong, that produces a lot. Look where he puts himself in the house of God. Now, to the Old Testament saint, that would be, well, in David's day, it was a tabernacle. In Solomon's day, he built the temple to be the temple. So that's the place where God is. That's the place that represents God's presence. So what he's saying is, I'm like a flourishing believer and the presence of God. It's a flourishing life, living life to the fullest while living in the best place there is to be. In Old Testament terms, in the presence of the Lord. He goes on to say, I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. You see, If you want to put your trust in somebody, do it in someone who you can trust forever. The word loving kindness is our known word again, kessed. Do you trust in the loving kindness of God? We should. All of us should. Living a righteous life before God is the best life one can live. And to be in the presence of the Lord, well, today, like that's, that's like walking in intimate fellowship with God. And as believers under the new covenant, we have the Holy Spirit. So that it becomes very real. His indwelling becomes stronger as we continue to trust in him and rely on his power. Do this every day. Because it's always there. You can always trust the loving kindness of God. And folks, children, I should say, this is for all of us. We can have a flourishing, blessed life in the presence of God. At the same time, we keep trusting him. 
we keep trusting him. Now, what's the result of this? That brings up verse 9. Results in praise. I will praise you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. Let's talk about the word praise for a moment. Let me write it up on the board. It's an important word, actually, for a Christian. We see it a lot in the Old Testament, but we should see it also in the New Testament. Praise. We often use the word thanksgiving, but they're not the same. The word praise in the Hebrew, the original word meant to throw. That's right, to throw or cast something. So the idea of praise comes from that probably because when you praise someone, you throw yourself down before them like the king, in this case, the Lord. Or perhaps you're giving, you're giving something to them. You don't walk up and hand it to them. You, you toss it to them or, or put it at their feet, something like that. In Revelation 4.10, we have um, th- uh, th- uh, crowns thrown to the Lord or before the throne, Revelation 4.10. He's so holy, you don't touch him, but you can get close by. The idea here is when you praise, let's just put God up here. This is you. When you praise, you're giving God something. It's just not thanks. It's more than that. That's why I don't like to say that's the same as thanks. It's not. But you're giving God something. You're giving him glory or honor. Perhaps some excellent words about God. You're a loving and kind God. The all-powerful, perfect, holy God. And when you do that, the focus is on God, you see. He's the one being lifted up, exalted, and glorified. Let's go back to our verse. Now that we've learned something about what praise means. Again, I will praise you forever. Notice continuously because you have done it. Done what? What we've just seen. What have you just seen throughout this psalm? He takes that evil person, puts him in his place. And then he blesses those who live the righteous life. The evil person gets what they have coming to them. And the righteous person receives that flourishing, wonderful life in the presence of God. Always trusting in his loving kindness. The psalmist goes on to say, I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. To wait shows patience. For the name, the name is God's person, who he is. So I will wait, I will trust in who you are. Notice, for it is good. You are a good God. And where did you do do it? In the presence of the godly, with other righteous saints. So he's saying, I will trust upon the Lord, on your name, on your character, because it is good. Now, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? Well, if you're evil, you're going to trust in your evil. But if you're righteous, you'll trust in God, his name, his person, who is good. He is the real refuge. He is the real savior. He is the one who blesses us. And when you praise God, You can do that with others who do the same. It's a wonderful time of worship. Well, let's close by looking at our psalm. Psalm 52. For the director of music, Amaskil by David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, 
David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, a tongue of deceit. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking what is right. Selah. You love all the words that destroy your deceitful tongue, yet God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. When the righteous see this, they'll be filled with awe and will mock the evildoer, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction? But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. Let's pray. Oh, Father, again, we thank you for this marvelous psalm. It has so much meaning, challenges with what we've heard. Help us understand it and apply it. And the power of your spirit, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.